Okay. I'm excited. Okay. Thank you for doing this with me. My pleasure. <laughs> your girl Margo here back again with another video and today I have a very special guest obviously you sure would. Um, and in the spirit of coronavirus and we're, we're, we're almost social distancing yeah almost social distancing Even though we've we basically been in the same house for like two weeks now exactly so we're locked fun. in together so um, so you have had a very long life I hope I have a lot longer one too <laughs> yeah. And I figured it was appropriate with all this coronavirus stuff to kind of uh, get us our minds off of it and... Right, to talk about my death, okay. Right. <laughs> Not exactly. But yeah, so you were born in 1950. That's right. Right, and I was only born in 2000. That's right. So I've only been alive for like 20 years ish. 19 years. 19 yes. years. Almost 20. Almost 20. Right. But um... I thought that we could go back and you could tell us a little bit about um, some of the things that you've experienced in your life. So what do you want to know about? So um, when you were born in 1950, uh, Jim Crow was still being enforced until 1964 when you were about 14 years old. Do you remember anything from that time? or? No, I remember, you know, uh, living in uh, metropolitan New York and living in the Bronx, I had black classmates in public school way before 1964 because I started I started uh, kindergarten I guess it would be 1955 and by 1964 already I was uh, graduating with what you would call now uh, uh, middle school it was junior high school and um, the only thing I re recall was that um, uh, sometime while I was in public school which would have been in the late 50s or early 60s you know they started to uh, bus uh, students into the elementary school but that's, and we called it public schools then. Um, so I guess it was more segregated than, than it is now, but it wasn't, wasn't an issue that we saw on a day-to-day -day basis or even knew or talked about. Uh, Follow-up question. Um, what was it like when, so you said that um, it wasn't really an issue that you lived with on a day to To settle, and I lived in basically what you might call a, you know, an immigrant neighborhood in that, you know, a lot of families were just like ours. They were, you know, as, uh, after World War II, uh, a lot of uh, immigrants from uh, Europe and, you know, so there were Eastern European Jews. It was a mostly Jewish white neighborhood, so there really wasn't that much of a mix. So, second question. Um, you lived during when Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, um, they were still around towards the beginning of your life. Do you remember ever seeing those? Well, no, I was, I was uh, more than that, I was a teenager. Yeah, sure. I uh, read about it in the papers, talked about it in school, talked about it with friends, listened to it on the radio. I was actually, I don't recall if I went to March on Washington. I think I might have been a little bit too young for that. But I recall other people that had and we talked about it. So I was socially aware in high school at the time. We knew about it. Cool. And we weren't, I wasn't from a, um, a socially aware family. So it wasn't something that like uh, you might have seen others more involved and we weren't not, not from a family point of view it, it, we didn't talk politics we didn't other than you know we really didn't talk politics or anything along that line uh so do you remember the assassination of martin luther king yeah very well i mean it it, uh, it disrupted a lot of things because uncle charlie was uh in the national guard and they were going to call up the national guard and so it was right around the time that uh, Aunt Renee and Uncle Charlie were going to get married, so they they almost had to postpone their wedding. Um, oh. I don't remember if he got called up or just didn't get called up, um, but I know that the, the wedding went ahead anyway, but yeah, we were aware. You went to Woodstock, didn't you? I went to Woodstock in the summer happen? of 1969. It was a, a, what they call a seminal event in your life. Woodstock was, uh, it was a great event. It was something that you really had to be there to understand. But it was a, a great communal experience. Uh, friend, I bought tickets. We were everybody that I knew from my neighborhood and from my high school and, and from my college. Uh, they were all my high school friends. And I was at college at the time. 
um, a lot of my high school friends went to college with me as well. We were all talking about it. It was all the buzz. It was on the radio. We were following the politics of it. And so we knew the history of it and where it was moving to. And so uh, I, was, I had a car and we decided we were going to go up and uh, go to it. So we got into the car. We had, I had a sleeping bag and a, and a small bag. I don't know what we were thinking. No food or anything. <laughs> and uh, we stopped off in Monticello on the way, which is right near where Bethel had ended up. And we had a friend that worked in a deli there, so we went there for dinner. And then we had another friend that was working at one of the local hotels. This was during the summer, and it was in the Catskill Mountains, and they had those hotels, casinos and such. So we stopped off, we pulled into the parking lot, and we watched one of the shows that was going on. And when we came out, the route, that was the route that was on the way to Yasker's farm, had become, instead of uh, one lane each way, had become five lanes, all going towards the farm grounds. The, showgrounds and it was at a dead stop at this point because they hadn't opened the gates it was a couple of miles down the road they hadn't opened the gates yet and the traffic had just backed up so it was at a dead standstill so at that point we started talking to the people that were stuck with us we decided to pull out so we kind of pulled out of the driveway we got stuck with everybody else everybody shut off their cars whoever had food would share their food whoever was around them whoever had drinks would said share their drinks whoever had drugs would share their drugs it was a very communal type situation uh -huh. we met people from california from michigan from from uh, canada from uh, all over the country uh, parts of the world we were all heading towards this this great event and uh, when we got there, uh, you know, it was just, it was spontaneous because there was no way to control the, the crowd. They never expected to have a half a million people show up or uh, close to a half a million people show up. So they didn't have the food, they didn't have, uh, they didn't have uh, toilets, they didn't have, so they, they didn't even take, somewhere in the attic is the, my tickets, they're in the magazine. <laughs> and they didn't collect tickets and it was just, uh, you know, the music was great, the camaraderie was terrific. Uh, we left a little bit early because it rained and we all got soaking wet and, and I had given out my dry clothes to other people. My sleeping bag was soaking wet because I set it up as using it for a tent so that people that didn't have any cover, we could all sit under cover. Hmm. Um, so that was kind of, and in those days they didn't have these lightweight uh, uh, sleeping bags. This was an army uh, supply <laughs> sleeping bag that was very heavy to begin with. Now soaking wet it was, it was uh, weighed a ton. So that wow. was it. We met some other friends, we had some great times, and like I said, and even the ride home was eventful. It just left you, it left you with a warm feeling inside. You really communed with a, a great part of the world. You didn't think it was just that group of half a million kids. It was, everybody was into it at that point. It's like a secret handshake. Uh, you went to Woodstock? Yeah, me too. Yeah, cool. You know, it's yeah. like, hey, have something in common. So it was cool. a, a lifetime experience. In those days, you know, like myself, I was 19, we could vote at that time. Um, actually, no, I take it back. We could drink at that time, but we weren't able to vote until we were um, 21. And the year that I turned 21 was the year that they lowered the voting age to 18. So, yeah, it was kind of like catch 22, because we were complaining. You were sending, the issue at the time was, you were able to dra get be drafted and go into the army and fight for the country, but you weren't allowed to vote. And so that was, that was the, uh, call it one of the cause celebs. Reverse both, right? They, yeah. they lowered the voting age uh, to 18 and they raised the drinking age to 21. Yeah. All right, so anyway. Um, did you watch the Challenger launch? The um, Challenger launch? Uh, that was so was many that? years later. As a matter of fact, I was working at the time at the, uh, the Morningside House, you remember that, and for some reason, I, I never uh, took sick days. I, I had Tons, I, I didn't take a sick day in like 10 years, but it just so happens I was home sick that day. And I said, oh, I get to watch it. Because most of the time the launches occurred, you know, during the work day. Mm -hmm. So other than uh, the early launches where I was in school and it became a school event where they would put it on the black and white TV, you know, that was not something I normally watch. So I got to watch, I was watching it when the Challenger went up and it exploded and I was as stunned as as anything else it, it was like the kennedy assassinate the kennedy's assassinations um just like it was just a, a stunning event so the soviet union broke up in 1991 uh, i don't remember when it occurred it was in the early 90s so uh, did you see a difference in anything hap like media coverage did you see a difference in no as a matter of fact most people didn't even realize there was no longer the ussr yeah uh, and it's okay to call it russia now because it was just russia but before yeah. people used uh, I use and I love these use Russia and USSR as synonymously. Okay. 
but uh, not even realizing because I didn't really study the geopolitics of the Soviet Union that much. I knew much a little more about Vietnam than I did about the Soviet Union, and nor did I really care all that much. So it was really enlightening to find out that uh, you know, there were all these nation states that were under the aegis of uh, the Soviet Union, and when they broke up, it became Russia and Tajikistan and yeah. Azerbaijan, all those places. So. Most people are not aware, but there was a, an original bombing in the World Trade Center in 1993. Oh, we were, Mom and I are really very aware of that. In the basement. In so, the basement in the garage, because Mom and I, uh, first of all, it occurred on a Saturday, and Mom and I were here at this house, and we, we had a Saturday program that we always watched uh, when we got up, and it was interrupted because of the bombing. Uh, but also, Mom and I used to go to the top of that particular building uh, for dinner all the time. It was a nice, there was a nice restaurant. We used to park in that parking lot. So, uh, yeah, we were real familiar with it. And, and uh, again, it changed, it changed life for a little bit. I mean, it wasn't as catastrophic as uh, the 9-11 uh, bombings, but it was significant enough to make an impact. In 1999, the Columbine shooting, how did that, you were actually planning on having a kid at that point, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, we were, well, yeah, know, we were working, right? that, you know, that really, it was a sad case and it was jarring in its magnitude and it was really the first case that of note and it was jarring because of the magnitude and, and such, but it didn't affect our lives. You know, it's a long, Columbine is not close to here. Yeah. And so, it really didn't affect uh, us in the household, and no one really talked much about it in the community. Did, you, did it affect your decision at all to have a kid? No, not so, none whatsoever. Okay. Um, so I was born in 2000. Correct. Obviously in 2001. Um, Actually, yeah, 9-11. Okay. So what, I love it when you tell the story of this because I just think it's, you know, I was there, but I wasn't there, there. So. Right, so I was a nursing home administrator at the time, as you know, in the Bronx, and it was my day off. But I had to go in for to do some introductions because there was a, a social work conference in the auditorium, not off, far from my office. We got to go into work a little bit later. I was taking into work because mom went to work, and I was babysitting you because it was a day off, so we didn't have to have the, the babysitter. So I put you in the back of the car, and mom said, oh, take diapers and take supplies. I said, no, I'm going to be there for an hour. We'll be back home in no time. We get down there and on the way down, it was a beautiful day, cloudless sky, really blue, clear day, New York, you don't see them that often, uh, very comfortable weather, and I'm hearing over the radio that, um, you know, there was a plane crash into one of the World Trade Centers, and there was all this discussion, I heard about it on the way down, and then it basically was confirmed while we were on the way to work, and as I was getting off the parkway, to get to us, uh, where we were heading towards my job, I just turned to you and I said, you know, Margot, you're gonna be growing up in a totally different world. The world has changed today. And prophetically, uh, you know, 19 years later, it has changed. Then we get to work and we confirm the second, now the second building uh, went, tower went down. And I was, at the time, I was, I was on an emergency management task force for New York City. And uh, we were working disaster planning for issues that might occur in, you know, in New York. Um, and we were talking about floods and flood man management, like Sandy, uh, because in the year or two before, the Army Corps of Engineers had put out new flood uh, plane uh, maps and realized nursing facilities and reading facilities were right on water's edge and all these flood plain areas and all these people were at risk. You know, so we need to figure out how we were going to deploy uh, material and evacuate people and we were working for years on on that kind of uh, planning and so at that point we were making the call around so it was, it was um, uh, coordinated by New York and, and the Greater New York Hospital Association as well as to what we were going to do. Well we were going to be a receiving facility where we were in the Bronx was kind of like up on a hill we weren't going to get flooded by any water plant so we'd always been designated a receiving facility in our plans so we were starting setting up to receive uh, patients, non-critical patients from the local hospitals, so that patients could be uh, am and brought in by ambulance to the critical care hospitals, like uh, at the time, Jacoby Hospital or whatever, uh, to do critical care. While that was going on, uh, and I was on the phone uh, with all these members from all over the city, and the ambulance uh, the companies and, and the food suppliers and such, you were with us. Uh, and so they had canceled the conference, but um, so now I was faced with two different problems. How to get these social workers home, because they were 
transportation was disrupted, the subways were shut, um, people, the nursing staff was afraid because they wanted to get homes to their families, but I needed people to take care of uh, the people at the nursing home residents that were sick and, and needed their care. Um, so we kind of worked out a system is if, that, if your replacement shows up, then you can go home, but if your replacement doesn't show up, you have to stay. So we did that. We stayed at work. I had about, a, I guess, a, a 14 hour day that day, even though I wasn't intended on being at work. And mom was at work for a long time too, but we had to go out. You didn't have any diapers, you didn't have any baby food, you didn't have anything. So the recreation the, the therapy departments uh, got games for you. So they got games for So we got games, and then the adult diapers, they cut them up so you could have diapers, and the kitchen made you food. Um, you had a grand old time. You were, you were on the couch in the president's office, and you were crawling <laughs> around and running around. When you were a toddler, you were running around uh, the offices. You had a grand old time. The staff loved having you. And then later that evening, uh, uh, on the way home, um, uh, I forgot, I know I made a grocery run to get diapers and such, but, um, and then uh, we went home. Uh, that was it. I mean, we still went to work the next day, but it was, it was kind of eerie. Eerie in the regards as to what is going on now with the coronavirus and that the streets were basically empty and there was no airplanes. And, you know, in New York, especially in the metropolitan area, you don't realize it, but there are flights overhead like every two minutes and yeah. it's just background noise that you never even realize. Yeah. And now that they had grounded all the planes, it was eerily quiet. It was yeah. very strange, but noticeable. Awesome, well thank you so much. You're welcome. Sorry uh, for all the interruptions, but that's okay. life. Um, well, thank you for answering all my questions. Okay. Um, I just thought that it's a good idea because I think it's important that everybody like talks to their parents during this time. I mean, we're all stuck in the house with our family members. And I think it's important that we all share our stories sure. about life. We appreciate and, it. And uh, especially with everything going on, it's a good way to take your mind off of it. So Sounds like a plan. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please be sure to subscribe and comment down below. Maybe some stories that you have from your family members. And um, yeah, just <coughs> take that time to ask your family members how their lives were and be nice to people. So, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Bye! <laughs>